Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. Today I have with me the goose that laid the golden egg, the most valuable member of law enforcement in the United States. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, you're all very valuable, but somebody who knows case law very, very well. And we're very thankful that he's on our side and our team and he wears the Street Cop brand on his shirt. And he's one of our instructors and I'm proud to have him. And thank God we're friends. But without further ado, the one, the only case law expert, Zach Miller. Man, it's been a while. It has been a while. I was looking over my notes. It's been several months. It's not. It's your fault. Partly. I was. I was ready to go last week. You weren't around. All right. What are we talking about today? Well, I was looking over that stuff you sent me, this Massachusetts stuff. It doesn't make any sense, you know? Like, Yeah, so it's a traffic stop. This is Massachusetts, the Commonwealth. Um, and the guy furnishes false information, or the girl, whoever, mm-hmm. when they're subject to a motor vehicle summons. And these guys are like, yeah, there's nothing we can do. And I kept repeating that. I go, you know, that was a common misnomer in New Jersey for years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And cops are letting wanted people just walk away. Right. And once you got them, you got them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to issue somebody a citation, I mean, you got to know who they are. I just don't. It's like, you're I saying, like, like it doesn't rise to the level. But I, I will also jump in here and say that in the state of New Jersey, we have uh, a breach of the peace requirement for a township ordinance. OK, so if you have uh, if you have a, a, a borough or city or township ordinance that's enacted by a local municipality. In order for us to be able to arrest for it, it has to be considered a breach of the peace. Oddly enough, on the other side of it, under our motor vehicle code, any violation allows us to arrest under the right circumstances, right? With a fake name and all that shit. However, on the other side of it, in order to be able to take continued action, it has to be a breach of the peace minimum requirement. So, for example... You go to a guy's house, there's a borough ordinance that you have to shovel the sidewalk in front of your house. Yeah. You walk up, you ring the bell, and the guy tells you, I'm not, you're not getting my ID. Your best, the only thing you could do is try to guess who he is by on his, on his uh, residency, maybe issue that, but you couldn't make an arrest on that uh-huh. for him being subject to that and him refusing to comply. Different right. if you've got a urinating in public offense which That's they can breach of the peace. an offensive breach of the peace right the crazy thing is, is there's no guidance on what a breach of the peace is other than the language of one which disrupts the tranquility enjoyed by the citizens of a community a yeah, breach of the peace is a common law term it's threatens or endangers public order um you know, it's a very broad term yeah peeing on the sidewalk that's a breach of the peace yeah not shoveling your sidewalk probably not unless it's like a i don't know is it a public like the public sidewalk yeah yeah, I don't know if it's a breach of the peace. That's a tough know. one, you it know? It could be. Yeah, it could be. Um, but people, like, we deal with, like, guys in Hoboken in Jersey City, they get open containers all the time. And that's mm-hmm. a borough ordinance. It's not a state law. Right. And I say, yeah, I would consider that to be a breach of the peace. But walking around and consuming alcohol in public is yeah. probably going to be a breach of the peace. Disturbs public order. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. sure it does. Yeah. Oddly enough, on the other side of it, if you don't wear a helmet on a bicycle, that's a motor vehicle law violation. That okay. would qualify under the right circumstances because of a different set of statutes to arrest somebody. Mm-hmm. If you were yeah. a 15 year old, I mean, you know, obviously that's, I think it's up to 16 years of age, but you know, for example, or riding against traffic on a bike. Right. There's these small things that people don't know about the law that are actually pretty impactful statutes. They should look into like your bicycle law, your pedestrian traffic law. They serve a, a very, very big, uh, totalitarian um, impact on taking something so little, something you don't even know exists and being able to achieve a larger law enforcement objective. And this is something I emphasize is like, you're not harassing people because not, nobody's more happier at a moment in their life when a police officer says, I just need your name. I'm not going to give you a ticket. Right. So if you don't have warrants, yeah, then it's like, Hey, I didn't know I couldn't do this. That's okay, man. We just got to get your name and information. We got to document it. And, you know, obviously we're going to check them through NCIC and all that stuff. And then it's, hey, brother, do me a favor. Next time in the future, just stay on the other side with traffic as you're driving on the bike. It is dangerous. We said a guy hit out here last week. Mm -hmm. Here is your ID back. No harm, no foul. 
Right. Fact, one, the best part is that person could go, yeah, I appreciate it. You know, thank you. Uh, I didn't know. And thanks for telling me, yeah, listen, a lot of people don't know. It's a little strange. I know I'm, I get it. But, and the cool thing is, is when they come back with an NCIC warrant for attempted homicide, six states away, which happens all the time, it sounds insane. It sounds like it's unorthodox police work, but it's very impactful. That's where the best stuff lies. People just have to understand that, you know, and I don't know. I think that because we're not emphasizing that stuff in police academies, people think it's foreign, but it's very, very good police work. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree. So it's a bit, you know, I always tell people, I had a guy ask me yesterday, because, you know, where I work, they're not very proactive. The sheriff said he's not into proactivity and I want to do it. And I said, look, put yourself in a position where you have to take action. So what is that? Hey, so what do you mean by that? I said, Put yourself in a position where you know you can compel identification. You're going to run warrant checks on people, namely passengers and these obscure people in society, not just drivers. So everything but drivers of cars. You're going to hit warrants. You're going to arrest somebody, find things, search incident. And now you start to show proactivity. There's no real major issue with it. This is a very comfortable way moving forward in proactivity of just serving existing warrants. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And, and and like you're really taking fugitives off the street. You know, maybe the first job, six know? or seven times is uh, somebody with a misdemeanor style warrant. You stay tenacious and stay at this. You're going to hit significant stuff. Uh, you know, I, I have there have been times I put people in cars and, you know, finally they gave up their information and that computer's going nuts. You know, nationwide extradition. Oh, shit. You know, it's a good day at work for me. Right. It's a good day work for anybody. <laughs> I, get, I get agencies calling me. Hey, you got this guy? Yeah, we're looking for him for four years. Where'd you get him? Backseat passenger of a car not wearing a seatbelt playing the name game. Uh, yeah, dude, right. you know, he, he he raped three kids. Right. We got He's going, dude, 20, I've had guys tell me I'm going to prison for 25 years. I, on what? What you just arrested me on. Right. How about this one? You'll like this one. I had a guy <laughs> one time. There's a funny story. I, I lock him up playing the name game, gives me his real name, ends up having a warrant at a Cobb County, Georgia for domestic violence, criminal mischief, nationwide extradition. Wow. And I said, do that very often. could you imagine? And I said, they're coming for you. He goes, what do you mean they're coming for me? I go, Cobb County, Georgia wants you. And I don't know what you did. And it was, yeah. he's like, oh, I feel like spray painted her car or something. I'm like, oh, yeah, he, and he got mad. And I'll never forget. He said to me, <laughs> you know, he got real upset. He goes, you weren't supposed to, I was going to decide when I went back, I went, you decided that this was going to be your fate. The minute you didn't show up to court and came to New Jersey, right. except I intervened and sent you back to go handle your business. And we're, you know, he's bickering back and forth to me. I said, so don't blame me for the things that you did. You just got caught. And now you're upset. Right. And then at the end, after this, this bantering went back and forth, and it wasn't hot and heated. I wasn't screaming. I'm not, I'm not a child. He goes, yeah, what'd you pull me for over anyway? I went, oh, you were driving down the center lane of the highway with no other traffic on the roadway. You have to maintain the right lane during that time unless you're passing, making no return, uh, making the left turn, overtaking another motor vehicle. And he, I'll never forget, Zach, he looked at me and went, yeah, that's real fucking cute. <laughs> and I went, I know, I know. Isn't, right. it, isn't it cute? <laughs> yep, the irony of it, yep. <laughs> so, you know, he, he just had, like, he could not stomach the fact that that's what he got snatched on. Right, right. But that's the best stuff. Mm -hmm. Not going to be 23 over the speed limit. Anybody with common sense knows that. Right, right. Not right. as a probability. There's always a possibility. Yeah. All right. So, you know, I was in Massachusetts. How we started talking about this thing was in Massachusetts. Again, people are under the impression that if somebody is a passenger in a vehicle, and they're adamant. You know, that's why I said we're going to really do our research on this because this is not the first time Zach Miller, Dennis Benino, Street Cop Training has found that there's been a misinformation about a law and everybody believes to be true in such a majority. They're so steadfast about it that we have disrupted that and say, we don't think you guys got it right. And here's why. So, you know, this is one that we'll we're bringing up now. It's a good topic of discussion, but I'd like to really be able to pitch our position strongly. Yeah. And, and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination an expert on Massachusetts law. I've probably spent a total of 45 minutes in my whole life reading Massachusetts law. But, you know, I mean, it it's, it's just kind of and I'm not discounting that they were taught that, you know, I absolutely believe that they were taught that. But it's kind of an absurd 
statement, if you think about it, I have a violation that I want to issue a citation for, and the guy's falsely or refusing to identify himself, and, and the advice is you just got to let him go. I, I don't understand that logic. I understand that that may not be a separate offense in and of itself, the failing to identify or the lying. I get that. Uh, I'm not arguing that, but I'm contest contending that you can place him under arrest and take him somewhere to identify him through finger seatbelt violation. You've yeah, now had to get right. He is he is in custody because I've got probable cause to believe he's violating the seatbelt law, and I have no means of identifying him to issue him the citation that I'm supposed to issue. And it's entirely reasonable, I think, it's under the Fourth Amendment to take him into custody to identify him. And then once we identify him, we cut him loose. We write him a citation. We cut him loose. So he's he's not being booked. You know, he's not being taken into custody for prosecution purposes. It's for identification purposes. So, um, you know, I think that is certainly an option. And of course, when you make a custodial arrest like that, what is the first thing you get to do? Search incident to arrest. Let's say we find an ID on him right there on scene. Now we have accomplished our, our purpose for taking him custody. We write the citation and cut him loose there. So we never even actually take him uh, to the precinct, or to the jail, or wherever we're going to identify him. It's pretty um, likely that he's probably going to have warrants for his arrest. Maybe, but maybe not. Yeah, yeah, and and exactly. I and mean, there's there's probably some criminal reason why he's providing a fake name. I mean, you know, you don't normally if you don't normally provide a fake name unless you have some ulterior motive behind it. And I think the common law crime of of hindering uh, a law enforcement officer could certainly be applicable. Um, I was reading that Commonwealth versus Adams. From 2019, where they say the, the Massachusetts appellate court says one of the elements of that offense is they has to they have to do something physical. They have to physically obstruct you or hinder your investigation. Um, so that's why I say asking him for his ID. Once I've got the basis for issuing that citation, I ask for his ID and he fails to produce it. Whether by lying or, or just saying I'm not going to do it, then that is a physical act and. You can arrest him for that, I would say. I would think you could arrest him for the common law hindering offense uh, and accomplish the same purpose, search incident to arrest and find out who he is. So we also have to keep in mind that they're insane in Massachusetts when it comes to the law. It's completely a lot of the stuff is wild. They're one yeah. of the very few states that have to justify reasonable suspicion of danger to now order somebody out of a vehicle on a traffic stop. So they don't they they've adamantly expressed that they mm -hmm. they have uh, departed ways with Mims and Wilson. And now going to that, let me let me just dial it back a second to try to catch people up to what we're explaining is people are confused sometimes of when somebody's lying about they are. And it really depends on what state you're in and what laws you can charge. States like Connecticut have a failure to identify statute. I believe Connecticut has one. So. You don't even have to worry about playing this game. If you believe they're failing to identify, you have a statute mm -hmm. that you can literally just slap on. And it really is a nice thing to have. And I don't know, 30 states have failure to identify statutes on the books. It doesn't mean you can't do anything in these other states. It just means you have to understand how you're going to employ the law minus the existence of a failure to identify statute. So in New Jersey, we have a statute called 39325, which says a police officer may arrest Lawsuit. somebody in his or her presence Lawsuit. in chapter three or chapter four of title 39 without anything else. So that gets clarified and Pierce comes along and says, say versus Pierce 1994. And they come along and say, look, 39, 525 should not be read literally. If you pull somebody over for a seatbelt and they have a good driver's license, you confirm their identity. You're not taking them to jail. You're going to issue a summons and release them. However, if you pull them over that same seatbelt violation and now your their identity comes into question through means of intentional deceptive behavior, uh, you believe the offender is not going to respond to a summons. You believe the offender is going to thwart the criminal justice process. It literally says that in the judicial code. Well, then make the arrest in lieu of the summons. So we are arresting on the motor vehicle law at that time, 39374, whatever it is for the for the failure to arrest, I'm sorry, uh, 376F, whatever it is, for the seatbelt violation with the mitigating factors or the aggravating factors of we don't know who this person is. So mm -hmm. people try to wrap their heads around this and go, you're literally arresting for the motor vehicle violation and you're authorized to do so because you have somebody who don't know who they are. And that motor vehicle law allows you to arrest under Title 39 and bring them back to police headquarters. No different than 
our ability to arrest for driving while suspended, which is considered a more serious offense. Or in New Jersey, driving while intoxicated is not a criminal code. It's actually in our motor vehicle law. So you don't get fingerprinted for driving while suspended. It doesn't go on your permanent record. It goes on your driver abstract history, but it's not a criminal offense in the state of New Jersey, where a lot of states you would get arrested, fingerprinted. You're still going to get arrested, but you're going to get released on a summons. We do not have bail set on drunk drivers here. So that's what I'm trying to explain to people. There is these circumstances where there's a technique that I teach about employing your ability to check somebody for warrants. So it starts with when you can compel ID. And then after compelling that identification, making sure you know what you can do if somebody's trying to lie about who you are and checking them for warrants. And at a very minimum, this is a very effective tactic for law enforcement, a very light tactic to have significant impact for society to bring offenders to justice. And a lot of great things come out of it. Prevention of future crimes and the seizure of contraband search incident to arrest, which might lead to search incident to the vehicle. You might go into a PC search of the vehicle if you can tie the contraband back to believing there's more inside the car. So people say, well, what do I do if I can't, you know, we don't have dogs, I can't get consent, da 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 this. And I think, well, listen, this is a great way to go about it. And it's actually a really good way from a tactic standpoint to get familiar with behavior. What is somebody going to do when they're nervous? They know they're going to jail. The lies that come with it. You're going to get good with paperwork and understanding narcotics and processing that stuff. So it's a really good place to cut your teeth as a proactive police officer. I agree. What else are we talking about today on um, the podcast? I've gotten several questions over the last couple of weeks that deal in one way or another with, with the plain view doctrine. Uh, there's definitely some misunderstanding of what it is. Um, it's, you know, to be, I guess, accurate in using the terminology would be the plain view doctrine of warrantless seizure. The plain view doctrine is an exception to the warrant requirement when it comes to seizing items, not conducting searches like the automobile exception is an exception for searches. Um, so the plain view doctrine, there, there are four things that have to be true in order to seize an item without a warrant. And of course, um, well, the first thing is you have to be in a lawful vantage point to be able to see the item. So the first prerequisite is the officer has to uh, have a right to be where he is. Uh, to see the item. What's an example of a lawful vantage point versus a non-lawful vantage point? Um, so uh, the, obviously the easiest example would be uh, executing a search warrant. If I'm inside of a house pursuant to a search warrant and let's, let's say I'm searching for stolen electronics, that's what my warrant is for. And I happen to see drugs in plain view. As long as I, well, the, the warrant gives me the authority to be in the house and as long as I'm looking in a place in the house where uh, they, uh, the warrant authorizes me to look for those electronics, and that's an example of me being lawfully present to, to view the, the, the item. Uh, an example where you, could, where you would be unlawfully present is if, uh, and I'm thinking about the Collins versus Virginia case, the motorcycle case, where the officers entered uh, Mr. Collins's driveway for the sole purpose of searching his motorcycle without a warrant, without an exigency, and without consent, um, they were unlawfully on the driveway. So they had no lawful right to be on the driveway in the first place, even though the motorcycle itself was in plain view. It was just parked in the driveway. Anyone can see it. Um, but since they didn't have a lawful right to be on the curtilage in the first place, the plain view doctrine would not allow them to search that motorcycle. So those are two just off the top of my head examples. What is a, was the key factor in Collins, the fact that they also removed the tarp from the motorcycle to the, reveal the VIN? Yeah, the, the tarp, the moving of the tarp was the actual search of the motorcycle. And the government argued um, that it was the automobile exception that allowed them to do that without a warrant. Um, but they, were remiss in understanding they had to lawfully be there in the first place. What's an example of lawfully being there? Going there for a service call? Yeah. So let's say, well, so in Collins, they knew he wasn't home. They knew no one was home. Um, so, but if, if say we didn't know if he was home or not, we just walked up to his front door to knock on the door to do a knock and talk to ask him some questions. And then that motorcycle is right there along that pathway to the front door. Then that would be an example of lawful presence. And you could see the VIN. The next big issue was they removed the tarp, which inevitably yeah. was a search without a warrant. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the court didn't even need to go into those issues because 
they resolved it on the fact that he wasn't lawfully. They, they weren't lawfully on the, the, the premises in the first place. People send, tend to argue that Collins v. Virginia removes the automobile exception from the driveway of a home. I don't know if that's necessarily true in a bright line sense. Yeah, right? I, I disagree with that. I've, I've heard that. And I talk about this in my case law classes. Um, there is definitely a common refrain out there amongst um, not just police officers, but, you know, uh, legal advisors and such that Collins says the automobile exception does not apply on residential curtilage. That simply is not true. I defy you to read the case and tell me where it says that. It says the automobile exception does not allow you to enter curtilage to search a vehicle without a warrant. It doesn't talk about whether if you're lawfully on the present premises in the first place. So I, I disagree forcefully with the fact that Collins says the automobile exception does not apply on, on a driveway, for example. It, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. We have two cases in New Jersey regarding plain view context that I'm going to throw in there too, just to really send it home so people can understand it. And the first one, they're very easy. Police officer walks up to a house, knocks on the door, can see through the front windows on the porch where he's standing lawfully, going there for a lawful purpose. Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to him, looks inside and sees narcotics. Is that an acceptable plain view exemption? He's there for a lawful purpose, knocks on the door, looks to the left, can see through the window mm -hmm. and sees narcotics. Well, so this is, that leads us to this, the, the other three elements of the plain view doctrine. Yes, the, the drugs are in plain view. That's not dispute. I'm not no one would dispute that. But just because you can see something doesn't mean you can seize it. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we do have the first prong of the, of the the plain view doctrine present lawful presence. We got that checked off. The second thing that, that has to be true is the item has to actually be in plain view. So it is here. Um, so we have a plane, an item in plain view, meaning I don't have to move something out of the way to see it. Um, I don't have to manipulate anything to be able to, to view it. So we have that in your scenario. We've got the first two prongs. The third is the item has to be immediately apparent to be, um, evidence or contraband. And we have, we will arguably, we have that we're on the front door, the front porch. We can see inside what clearly appears to be drugs. So it's immediately apparent that this is contraband in this case. Immediately apparent means probable cause. I've got probable cause from viewing it to believe it's contraband. But the problem where the plain view doctrine falls apart here is the fourth one. In order to get my hands on the item, the plain view doctrine says I have to be able to do that without further intruding upon a constitutionally protected area or reasonable expectation of privacy. So here, to physically get my hands on those drugs, I would have to open the door and walk inside that house to get my hands on the drugs. That is a further intrusion than what I'm already doing by standing on the front porch, knocking on the door. So this is an example of, yes, it's in plain view, but the plain view doctrine will not allow me to go inside that house to seize that those drugs. I would need either another exception to the warrant requirement, which would be exigency or consent, or you need a search warrant in that mm -hmm. case. So in that case, you would stand there call for another unit maybe, or say, hey, I got to get a search warrant for this place. I see it. I can't go in. Mm -hmm. And you're going to sit there and wait. Maybe the, the residency is unoccupied and you're going to get a search warrant. You're going to call the judge and say, your honor, this is what we have. I came up here for this. I looked inside. Here's what I'm seeing. It's clear as day. I'm swear that this is true. And hopefully get a telephonic. You've got to secure that residence. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is if some circumstances change, we might be going into a possible warrantless search. Maybe sure. somebody now hears you on the front door, sees you, panics, closes the curtains, and you hear now items being moved around. Would that give you exigency? That, to go that's, that's a perfect textbook example of an exigency. Uh, the exigency being the reason to believe the evidence will be destroyed or lost if I don't go inside right now. Um, you know, it, it, we're not just speculating. We have actual facts that would, would lead us to draw that conclusion. Those things that you just mentioned, um, you know, absent having a reason to believe somebody is inside, um, that's not going to be an issue. So just because yet yeah, they, the drugs could be destroyed or could be lost, that doesn't rise to the level of exigency. You would need positive factors like you just identified. Um, and then, yeah, we can go inside with the purpose of preventing those drugs from being destroyed or lost, which would, which would be uh, accomplished by detaining the people in the, in the, in the residence. We, we would go inside and secure the people 
because without people having access to it, the drugs are not going to be destroyed. Now, once we're lawfully inside on that exigent circumstance, then the plain view doctrine would allow us to seize those drugs that are in plain view without a warrant now, but further exploring the house for more drugs, warrant, exigency, or consent. I'm going to just go back to my next example of a case that I've read in New Jersey that is precedent here. It's case law where, and I don't know the finite details at the beginning, but essentially a police officer learns of information that there may be some kind of illegal activity. Let's call it a marijuana grow on the second floor of this house. What this police officer does is gets a ladder, climbs up the ladder, looks inside, and then applies for a warrant based on a plain view context. Is there a problem with that lawful vantage point at that point? Yeah, that, that would probably be, I would imagine, without having read the case, that the, the, the act of climbing the ladder to peer in the second floor window would, like, would likely uh, render it an unlawful vantage point because that's not a place that uh, a person would normally expect to see someone peering into a second floor window. Now, if you're in a, like a row house where you know, the neighbor is literally, you can reach out your window and touch the neighbor's house and you're viewing it from their second floor window, that could certainly be. Now, going into these lawful entries, are there any murder scene exceptions to the written warrant requirement? Or how about fire scenes? Any specific scenes that would allow you to not have to apply for a search warrant prior to going in is, is, a, is a homicide an exception? There is no homicide scene exception to the warrant requirement. Um, where just because we have a reasonably a homicide has occurred inside a house, we don't need a warrant to go inside and collect evidence or, or investigate. Uh, there still has to be an actual exigent circumstance. Now, I would imagine in most fresh, newly discovered homicide scenes, that probably would be um, the case. Um, there's Mincy versus Arizona, which is a, a case that deals with crime scenes. Um, being a, perhaps in the type of exigency, like the need to go inside to preserve evidence that might be destroyed if we don't do it now to, um, you know, uh, make sure there's no perpetrators inside mm -hmm. and make sure that nobody needs emergency medical uh, attention, though that could be present in a lot of cases like that. But there's no just blanket because I think a homicide occurred in this house. I can go in without a warrant and start collecting evidence there. There is no exception. Now, fire scenes, obviously an active fire is clearly uh, a type of exigency. And you could argue either an exigent circumstance or the community caretaking exception. Well, I guess we can't really do that anymore because Cornelia versus Strom says that's out. So that's, that's clearly an exigency. If we don't go inside right now, um, someone's likely to be hurt or killed or, or substantial property damage will occur. So that, that's why the fire department does not need a warrant to go inside your house and put a fire out. Um, we actually have a case in New Jersey, and hopefully, I mean, we're going off uh, a little to the left and to the right here a little bit outside of things that I typically teach. But I recall reading a case in New Jersey where I believe when initially fire investigators go in during this whole process, it unfolds. Mm -hmm. They don't need a warrant then. However, if they leave and come back, then they need a warrant. So. How to remember is hot fire good, cold fire no good. That's exactly right. And I'm the name of the case escapes me right now. It's out of Michigan. There's actually two of them that all your fire marshals know. Um, I, I want to say, I don't want to miss. It's Michigan versus something, and I, it's it's a uh, Tyler. Michigan versus Tyler. Yeah. Once uh, when the fire department initially enters to extinguish the fire. As long as someone from the fire department remains on scene, um, they can begin their investigation without a warrant um, for looking for cause of the cause of the fire. But once they abandon the scene to go back in to conduct to to further the investigation, they would need a warrant. So, um, yeah, yes. it actually reminds me of a story. We have a case here. and I can't remember the name of it years and years ago. So what happens is. Essentially. I try to get people to understand that probable cause comes in many different shapes, forms, and sizes, depending on what your investigation is. Yes. Everybody thinks probable cause is marijuana or a plain view or a shell casing, because typically it's what we, we run into. We had a job years and years ago. Here was a case, and there was a gentleman driving around who they had a fire. They had an arson, 
And I forgot the details of it, but he was named as a suspect in the case. Not too long after this fire had occurred, they realized it was an arson. This is all like unfolding pretty quickly. Police officer locates the suspect, stops the car, and smells an overwhelming odor of gasoline. That gave him probable cause to search the car under the automobile exception for the gasoline smell because he was a suspect in an arson. And they found, uh, obviously, they documented the strong odor of, of gasoline, but they actually found a bike that he used in the trunk of this car, as wild as it sounds, that matched a closed circuit television, you know, a, a surveillance video from a gas station where he went trying to be incognito and purchased the gas cans that were found at the crime scene. Hmm. So he tried to suppress saying all he did was smell gas. And the court said, we agree. Typically, gas doesn't give you probable cause, but they were investigating an arson and you were the suspect. And that car reeked of gasoline. That gave them the right to go inside and look for, right. you know, uh, these kind of uh, the combustibles that will that will start a fire. Right. You, you don't probable cause doesn't work because, I mean, we think of like the odor of marijuana or drug paraphernalia in plain view. We think of contraband as being the basis for the search, but and which is certainly true. But, you know, you can you can have probable cause to search for evidence. You know, a gas can is not contraband. You know, gasoline is not contraband, but not inherently. Right. Exactly. But it, if it is evidence of a crime and you've got probable cause to believe it's in a location, then you obviously you can search for it. In this case, the automobile exception allows us to do it without a warrant. We had a friend of mine got sent to a bank where some kind of group was committing this this fraud with bank checks and, and people's names, whatever. So they pull into this bank up here and he gets sent there, pins the girl in, you know, bank notifies me, get the picture on the wall. He Now she's here trying to pass these checks. He calls me and I said, well, what do you got? He goes, I got checks everywhere all over this car. I can see all sorts of people, different people's mail. He goes, do you think I got the car? I go, yeah, you got the car. He goes, what do I got? In the car? I got the whole car. But Rob, you got the whole thing. He called his prosecutor. His prosecutor told him, nah, 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 nah. You know, hold on a second. That's not like drugs or something. Let's impound. Let's talk to a judge and try to get a warrant for it. I said, Bobby, you're at a drive through You're called for a bank fraud. The girl matches the picture that they have attached to the bulletin on the window at the drive through You got the actual bad checks that she passed. You can see in plain view bad checks inside the car. The car's yours. Yeah. You don't need to go for a search warrant. And I think about these these legal advisors who are where where in your right mind did you think you had to go for a search warrant? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, this the probable cause is pretty clear. If that if that is the the argument is whether we have probable cause or not, I don't. I think you're looking at probable cause in a rearview mirror here. I mean, you clearly have probable cause in a situation like that. And if you have a and the automobile exception, the full automobile exception in your state, then yeah, you can search it without a warrant. Um, in that case. When yeah. do people typically have limited scope of search? Can you explain that a little bit? Like as far as like whether you can look at the trunk and things like that. Trunk and under the hood. Yeah. I mean, I've seen I've seen cases that go both ways that, you know, if I've got probable cause to believe there is, you know, drugs in the car, but no reason to believe there's a sales quantity of drugs, just drugs. You know, some courts and I think New Jersey is one of them. Right. That says you right. can't search the trunk. Um, because it's not reasonable to think there would be user quantities of drugs in the trunk. And, and I mean, I would agree with that point, but I don't know that probable cause for drugs is so limited. I mean, I think it's just probable cause where there's drugs in the car. The scope of the search is defined by what you're looking for. And in this case is drugs. Um, I was reading a case, uh, a Maryland case just yesterday that talks about this very same issue. Uh, I think I have it here somewhere, um, state versus uh, Johnson versus state from, from this year. Uh, and it talks about this very issue, you know, just because I find some drugs in the car or I don't have any reason to be selling drugs, that doesn't mean I can't search the entire car. You know, once I find some drugs in say the ashtray, I don't have to have a reason to believe there's more drugs in this car. I just have to know that I'm searching for drugs and finding some drugs doesn't mean that I can't now look for more drugs. So mm -hmm. those there's cases that limit searches to, to particular areas of the car. Uh, I'm not sure that those are correct, at least as far as Fourth Amendment purposes. And I don't know if these are decided on state grounds, but, you know, probable cause is probable cause. I, I've never seen 
a case where probable cause is defined differently under a state constitution. I mean, I think probable cause is a pro is it's a it's an accepted standard, regardless of whether you're talking about state constitutional law or federal constitutional law. You know, essentially our case law does not regard anything more than intoxicants being limiting when we talk about narcotics or alcohol. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people say to me, well, where does it say that if I find a gun, I get the whole car? And my, re my response is, it actually has some very vague language in some of the cases that we're talking about. But my response to you is, where does it say that you can't? And then yeah. we go back to the U.S. Supreme Court and Fourth Amendment standard of New Jersey hasn't departed ways from the fourth on this. They've only departed for, for ways from the fourth on this one very limited section of probable cause. So guys in Rhode Island were in my class yesterday in uh, Massachusetts, and they said, what are we comfortable reading if Rhode Island hasn't addressed it? And my response to them is, if Rhode Island hasn't addressed it, it means they're following a Fourth Amendment standard. And a lot of times, I don't know if this is if this is true, I don't see a lot of suppression attempts or appellate attempts in states where I think maybe the defense attorneys are well aware of the state's position on following the Supreme Court of the United States, and they're not trying to push to establish a new rule. For example, in Missouri, in a couple of pieces of case law, they repeat the same language over and over again. Missouri has historically followed the Fourth Amendment to a T. We do not depart from it. It's That's kind of the language that's in the Missouri mm -hmm. uh, case law that I've read. Do you think that defense attorneys are dissuade from trying to change the precedent, knowing that they're going to follow the Supreme Court? It's been decided there already. I mean, if you have clearly established case law on point to whatever the issue is in your case, then, you know, you would... I, I would think you would be um, wasting your time to make that argument um, unless you have some kind of novel argument that's never been made before. Um, you know, and I think a defense attorney's perspective is a little bit different than a prosecutor's when it comes to um, concern about establishing a type of precedent that may be unfavorable. I mean, the defense attorney's position is to defend this client in this case, Um so I don't know that a defense attorney worries too much about, you know, what is what are the down the road consequences of me making this argument? Um, my priority is to make sure this client um, I can defend this client the, the best that I can versus a prosecutor. You know, we probably do need to be more concerned about, you know, potential ramifications of adverse decisions um, down the road. People will say to me sometimes, you know, my prosecutor doesn't want to appeal. And I say, you know what? then don't fight it because what that tells me is they're not confident in their skills and abilities to try to get an appeal in their favor. And a lot of these people will disengage to, to avoid establishing precedent because they know that's just outside of their wheelhouse to try to establish good stuff. And you see it before and you've seen it again a thousand times. You have prosecutors and even defense attorneys arguing improper cases that are inapplicable to the current circumstances. And what do the courts say? Well, you guys didn't argue this. If you would have argued this, we would have had a different position. But you argued this. And since you argued this, eh, it doesn't apply here. Yeah. I mean, an appellate court and, and, and a trial court, too, you know, where you have a motion to suppress or something like that, the, the issue is going to be decided based on the arguments that the, 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 the lawyers make. You know, if your, 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 your brief doesn't contain uh, a viable argument. Uh, most courts are not going to go out of their way to find a viable way to uphold your your case. They're going to limit their uh, their analysis to what your argument is based upon. Hmm. You know, and as far as prosecutors, you know, this is a product of state law. You know, you, you don't have an absolute right of appeal as a prosecutor. Uh, most states limit what the prosecution can appeal in a, from a trial court to an appellate court to very narrow circumstances. You know, a defendant, for the most part, I mean, as long as the issue is preserved properly, has a has a, a pretty broad right of appeal um, regarding adverse trial decisions. But prosecutors typically don't. You know, just because we don't like how a case turned out doesn't mean we can just appeal it. You know, uh, from the prosecutor side, usually it has to be an issue of constitutional implications, um, and then there's other statutory limitations as well. And of course, you can't appeal a verdict. Um, as a prosecutor in most cases, you know, just because you, you think the guy's guilty, but the judge found him not guilty, that's not something that's subject to appeal. You'd have to prove some kind of, uh, you know, def deficiency in the ruling. 
Yeah, and and even then, it's limited as to what you can you can appeal. Even even though the judge may absolutely be wrong as a matter of law, um, but that doesn't give the prosecutor a right of appeal. The the it's your it's your um, statute, state statute, criminal procedure statutes that give you um, basis for appeals. It's a wild system, isn't it? It is. It, it's there's a lot to it, and you know, and, and most, uh, and I don't know why you would, but most police officers don't don't understand that stuff. It's not what we do. Our job is to investigate uh, crimes and put put good cases uh, before before the prosecutor. Um, the procedural aspects is that's what lawyers are for. You know, I mean, so um, it's nice to know some of these things as police officers. But, you know, just because we don't like the outcome of a case and it makes no sense to us, there may actually be a very good reason why this case is not being appealed or why this case got dismissed or or no prost or whatever it was so, or dealt down or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But, but but ask questions. I mean, prosecutors also should be able to answer the questions. You know, if we if an officer has a question as to why a case was disposed of in a particular manner, the officer has an obligation to ask. And I think the prosecutor has an obligation to give a, a, a good answer. So we yeah. all learn. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. You know that this is a funny area we start getting into here. Yeah. It was a, yeah. Go well, we can go before. on for hours about this one. Oof. Uh, you know, listen, and, and our job is not sit here and come up with theories on why things are fucked up our job is to come here and try to provide clarity to the law enforcement community on right this is what you can do this is what you can't do here's why and there's a lot to know and you know knowing what you even knowing more than the average bear in this profession again this is not a sales pitch but taking a couple case law classes maybe if you understand some of the applicable laws and it's really dialed down to make it comprehensive where you can really really internalize it when you're presented with situations there's a lot of confidence that comes out of that you can stand there confidently and say no i know exactly what we can do i've read this there's no if ands or buts about it i know what circumstances we're facing i've seen these before and i know it was accepted by the law and i know why i think that's mm-hmm. i don't know why the, the court held that way yeah absolutely all right, man. Well, listen, right. I will see you next week and right. let me know what topic you want to discuss and get that ready for Massachusetts because yeah, I need to fun. give them an answer in some sense. So whatever you got back and we can we can move up forward with that. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. All right. Talk to you later.